This video contains a paid partnership with BetterHelp. Hello and welcome to this episode of Night Sky News for January 2024 with me, astrophysicist Dr. Becky Smethurst. This is the show where we chat about what you should look out for in the night sky in the next few weeks and then we chat about what's been happening in space news in the past few weeks. In this episode, we're chatting about yet more research that's been done using the James Webb Space Telescope that's made the crisis in cosmology, aka the Hubble tension, much worse. Plus, how NASA has finally got the OSIRIS-REx capsule open. And of course, the recent American Astronomical Society meeting where many new results were announced, including the discovery of the big ring megastructure of galaxies. There's chapter markers down here if you want to skip ahead to any of those specific news stories, plus any scientific research papers I mentioned are all going to be linked in the video description down below, free to read. So without any further ado, let's kick things off and start by looking up. First up, in these last few days of January, see if you can spot Saturn low in the western sky just after sunset. Into the western sky! This should be visible wherever you are in the world for about an hour or so, but you will need a fairly clear horizon or a high vantage point to spot it because it is so low down. And it won't be around for much longer because by early February, it's going to be too close to the sun from our perspective here on Earth and it's going to get washed out in that brighter light of the sunset. And for the next few months, it'll continue on its orbit, sweeping behind the sun until it hops out on the other side, until it becomes visible again, this time in the morning sky before sunrise, around about the end of April. So if you've got some clear skies on the next few nights, see if you can spot it while you can. If you're more of a morning person though, on the morning of the 27th of January, look out for a conjunction of Mercury and Mars just before sunrise. A conjunction is when two objects in the sky look close together from our perspective here on Earth. So in the case of two planets, you know, they just look like they've aligned in their orbits. Now, for Mercury and Mars on the 27th, they're only going to be about 0.2 degrees away from each other, which is about the width of your little finger held out at arm's length. So they should be really close together. So if you've got binoculars or a telescope, you should be able to see both of them at the same time, you know, in the same field of view as you look down your binoculars. But you will need a clear horizon though, because, you know, they're going to be very low down on the sky in the glow of that approaching sunrise as well, which will wash them out a little bit, meaning both Mercury and Mars will look very, very faint. I really don't think this is one for those of us in northerly latitudes either because the angle of the plane of the solar system right now, you know, the path that the sun and the planets all take through the sky, it's very shallow in winter, that angle. So the planets don't rise that high before the sun does behind them. Whereas the further south you are, the steeper that angle is, meaning like Mars and Mercury can rise higher before the sun rises, making them easier to spot. They'll only be visible for around about 45 minutes though. So you've got a very narrow window to spot this. And if you miss them, don't worry. Worry, it's not a waste to get up because Venus will be much more obvious just above them. Venus is the brightest object in the night sky after the sun and the moon. So it's going to be a lot more obvious to spot. It's higher up so you can see it for longer as well. And it won't be lost in the glow of the sunrise like Mercury and Mars will be. If you're still not sure though that what you're looking at actually is Venus, then if it's clear on the morning of the 7th of February, look out for it because they tiny slither of a crescent moon, aka my beloved toenail moon, will pair up with Venus for about an hour or so before sunrise. With a waning crescent moon in the morning skies though, that can only mean one thing and that is that the new moon phase is next on the 9th of February and so it's the nights around that that are going to give you the darkest skies this month. So if you were thinking about trying out some astrophotography, those would be the nights to do it and hope for clear skies. I'll link one of my previous videos with tips on photographing the night sky in the video description down below if you're a complete beginner and want to get started. And looking into February towards Valentine's Day, we've also got Jupiter pairing up with the moon on the 14th. This is going to be visible wherever you are in the world, in the western sky, from sunset to around midnight. Once you've found Jupiter and the moon, look directly up from there and see if you can spot the Pleiades star cluster. It looks to the naked eye like a mini version of the Plow or the Big Dipper constellation, but you'll notice that to the eye, it also looks sort of fuzzy, which is the combined glow of thousands of stars that you just actually can't see with your eye. So if you've ever bought binoculars, either for a concert or for bird watching or for sports, then break them out on Valentine's Day and see if you can spot either Jupiter's moons or the thousands of stars in the Pleiades cluster. All right, that's it for looking up at the night sky. But before we chat about what's been happening in space news, I want to chat about something that's still considered a little bit taboo, and that is mental health. 
There are so many things that can help with your mental health. For me, that's getting out into nature and under the stars. It just gives me that reset and fresh perspective that I so desperately need, especially when I've been staring at a screen for far too long. But sadly, there are some things that a good stargazing session just cannot fix. And that's where therapy comes in for me. Thanks to therapy, I now have tools that can help me calm my anxiety and then also process the thoughts and the feelings that have led to that anxiety as well. And that is what BetterHelp offers. This is a paid partnership with them. They make connecting with a therapist so easy and convenient for those of us with busy lives. The platform is online and your therapy is done remotely so you can just fit it around your lifestyle. By filling out a few questions, BetterHelp can connect you with a credentialed therapist in under 48 hours in most cases. But if it turns out you don't mesh well with that therapist, then you can easily switch to another free of charge. So if you've been thinking about therapy but life has just got in the way, please don't put off your mental health any longer. Look, there's a link to betterhelp.com forward slash Dr. Becky in the video description down below, which if you click not only supports this channel, but also gets you 10% off your first month with BetterHelp. So thanks again to BetterHelp. And now let's chat about what's been happening in space news in the past month. Now, January can only mean one thing in the world of astronomy and astrophysics, and that is the annual American Astronomical Society Winter Meeting, or AAS as it's known. This was the 243rd AAS meeting and saw around 3,000 of my colleagues descend on New Orleans to chat about their latest findings. Sadly, I could not go this year, although it felt like the majority of my collaborators did, so I had major FOMO. But if you want an idea of what a day at AAS is like, the PhD students writing for the site Astrobytes did a daily blog, which I'll link down in the video description below if you want to check it out. But what AAS means for the field as a whole is that there is a huge number of new astrophysics results that are either presented or announced for the first time. Some of those get put out as press releases as well. Those are the ones that tend to make it into the mainstream media, but also all of the abstracts for the talks that are given make it onto the Astrophysics Data System or ADS, which is kind of like Google for astrophysics research. So one piece of research that was presented at AAS that got picked up a lot by the media and so many of you sent me online as well was this discovery of a huge mega structure of galaxies that's been dubbed the Big ring. Now, this research that was presented by Lopez and collaborators hasn't yet been published in a paper, but the exact same research group in 2022 published this paper on the discovery of another megastructure dubbed the Giant Arc, which I'll link in the video description down below if you want more info. Now, the way they find these megastructures is really quite clever because the galaxies that make them up are quite faint because they're quite far away, but the gas in those galaxies still affects any light from background objects that are much brighter, like quasars, growing supermassive black holes in distant galaxies that can outshine all the starlight of those galaxies. Now, the light from the quasars passes through the foreground galaxies in the megastructure, and light at a very specific color or wavelength is absorbed by magnesium, for example, in the gas, leaving an imprint on the light in the form of a gap at a specific color or wavelength. But then that light is redshifted, stretched out some more on its way to us through the expanding universe, and so that gap in the light is shifted to a longer, i.e. a redder wavelength. So not only can we tell that a galaxy is there because we've got this missing wavelength of light, but also so we know how far away that galaxy is from how much that missing wavelength of light was redshifted by as well. And so it was using this method with data from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey that Lopez and collaborators were able to map out these galaxies that were doing the absorbing and find that they were all at a similar distance, making them part of this mega structure of the big ring. But actually, if you look at the big ring in like three dimensions, it's more of a corkscrew shape than an actual ring. But the really interesting thing about this whole research is in our best model of the universe, things like the Big Ring shouldn't exist. So like one of the fundamental sort of like properties underlining our understanding of cosmology, so the understanding of like the formation and the evolution of the entire universe, is that the universe is both isotropic, i.e. it looks the same in all directions, 
and homogeneous, meaning it is the same everywhere. So matter is roughly evenly distributed. Now, obviously on smaller scales, that's not the case because the Milky Way is just lots of clumps of gas and stars, which is itself one big giant clump in empty space where it's another two and a half million light years until you get to the next big clump of stars of Andromeda. But if you keep zooming out on large scales, there should be no more big clumps or big structures beyond about a size of 1.2 billion light years across, according to our best model of the universe. Now, if you look at the Big Ring, its diameter is 1.3 billion light years across, and its circumference is about 4 billion light years, which technically challenges our best model of the universe. Now, if you just had one giant megastructure, you could probably write it off as a bit of a statistical fluke. You know, perhaps there's just some this very, very, very long tail to, to sort of bigger structures and the distribution of, of how big structures are in the universe. But the giant arc that Lopez and collaborators also discovered a few years ago is around about 3 billion light years long. Not only that though, the giant arc and the big ring are in roughly the same part of the sky and they're around about the same distance away from us with the light taking around about 9 billion years to get to us, meaning that they existed at the same time in the universe's history. The discovery of these structures just adds to an ever-growing list of large structures that seem to violate these fundamental principles of cosmology. That includes the Sloan Great Wall at about 1.4 billion light years across, and then also the largest known structure, the HCB Great Wall, at 10 billion light years across. But like I said, you could explain away one of these megastructures, maybe two, it's just sort of like random statistical fluctuations, but not all of them that have been found. Like this is a big, long-standing problem, one we still don't have definitive answers for. And I think this discovery of the big ring that was announced at this year's AAS winter meeting was just a friendly reminder that we still haven't solved it. Another AAS announcement to hit the news was that Gordon and collaborators using the Hubble Space Telescope managed to image the galaxy that hosts the most distant fast radio burst ever detected, which is again around about 9 billion light years away. So fast radio bursts or FRBs are these very brief, very powerful bursts of radio light. They emit more energy in that one brief burst than the sun does in an entire year. So they're incredibly powerful. And since the first one was discovered back in 2007, we now know of around about a thousand of them, some that repeat, some that don't repeat, but we're still not entirely sure what causes them. Although most people seem to now be leaning towards magnetars, which are a type of neutron star, a dead star left behind by a supernova, which has an incredibly strong magnetic field. We're talking a trillion times stronger than Earth's magnetic field. So this burst, FRB 2022-0610A, was first detected in June 2022 using ASCAP in Australia. And then the VLT in Chile looked in the direction it was coming from and found sort of three blobbish clumps of light that it couldn't resolve. That sounds like a job for the Hubble Space Telescope, which was the research that was announced this month at AAS by Gordon and collaborators, revealing that this FRB came from a galaxy in a group of galaxies which all appear to be in the process of merging together. And that is really interesting because it could be that the conditions in the merger are what have triggered the fast radio burst. And so this research is going to feed into all of our theories and ideas over what produces these FRBs. Bees. Moving on though now, because you know that the big discussion that was happening at AAS was always going to be about JWST, especially the stuff that is confusing the hell out of us. So this research from Pandia and collaborators actually made it onto the front page of the New York Times after they presented it at AAS. And this work was looking into the 3D shapes of galaxies seen in the early universe with JWST. And it turns out they look remarkably different to what we're used to seeing in the nearby universe where galaxies are much older and more Evolved. In the nearby universe, we tend to see well-defined spiral shapes that are what we call axisymmetric. So they're the same all the way around. They're like frisbees, right? Flat and round. Or we see lots of very round, blobbish, spherical galaxies, kind of like a football in shape. But then rarer still are the odd few things that are like spheroids, but stretched out with cigar shapes, or even some that are what's known as triaxial. So three different radii in the three different dimensions, kind of like a kiwi or a surfboard. 
But what this paper by Pandia and collaborators have found is an increase in the surfboard and cigar-shaped galaxies at earlier times in the universe. How you actually do this scientifically is you actually model the shapes of the galaxies that you've seen. And you actually work out, okay, what is the length of the radii of these galaxies in all these different dimensions? So, you know, are they axisymmetric with two being the same? Or are they triaxial with all three being different? And then you make this diagram showing the ratio between the lengths of their different axes. So this is just showing model data of what each type of galaxy looks like on this diagram. But here you can see the real data from JWST and how at lower redshift, i.e. for nearby galaxies in the nearby universe, you have galaxies spanning a large region of this diagram. But as you go to higher redshift, i.e. further away galaxies in the early universe, the position of the galaxies on this diagram changes and overall start to trace this sort of banana shape, which gives this research paper its fun name. They even picked out some of these fun shaped galaxies that are much more prolific in the early universe than we thought that do look a bit like cigars or pool noodles as the press release went with. Now look, this might all sound like a bit of fun talking about pool noodles and surfboards, but this is actually really important to understand the shapes of these galaxies so that we can understand how galaxies in the early universe formed and then evolved into what we see today. Like we're still not really sure how we ended up with so many flat spiral galaxies in the universe today. So the next steps after this research are going to be to try and recreate some of these cigar and pool noodle shaped galaxies in simulations of the early universe to see, you know, what conditions give rise to what we're seeing with JWST and just see what we can learn. Now, another JWST story from the AAS conference that I want to touch on that wasn't really picked up on by the media, but from talking to my colleagues and collaborators that were there, this was one of the big points of discussion at the meeting. And that was this work from Picucci and collaborators showing that supermassive black holes in the centers of galaxies in the early universe are much more massive than we would expect. So for some context here, there are a load of correlations between the mass of the supermassive black hole and their galaxy's properties. So for example, the mass in stars of a galaxy is correlated with the mass of the supermassive black hole and also the distribution of the velocities of stars in a galaxy is correlated with the mass of a supermassive black hole. And we interpret these correlations as co-evolution, the supermassive black hole and the galaxy growing together in mass over time along that correlation. Or in other words, as the black hole gets heavier, the galaxy also gets heavier in terms of forming more stars. But when Bakuchi and collaborators put the galaxies observed with JWST on this plot, along with their measured black hole masses, the black holes are 10 to 100 times more massive than the black holes in galaxies of the same mass of stars in the nearby universe. That's what's shown with that blue line there. To put it another way, the Milky Way supermassive black hole at its center is around about a thousandth of the mass in stars in the galaxy. So about 0.1% of the mass in stars. Whereas these galaxies spotted by JWST are around about 1% to 10% of the mass of stars. Sometimes even the supermassive black hole is the same as the mass in stars of the galaxy. And that is incredible to think that they are the same mass. Like this has huge implications for this age old question of what came first, the galaxy of stars or the supermassive black hole at its center. And if the supermassive black holes are that overmassive, then perhaps they do form first and the galaxy of stars builds up around them over time much more slowly. But for that to be the case, they have to have first formed with a mass of over 10,000 times the mass of the sun, which is at the very top edge of what simulations can achieve in terms of a direct collapse of gas down into a black hole in the early universe. So very interesting findings, albeit only for like 21 galaxies for now, but I think this research will sort of spur on a lot more sort of studies with JWST searching for galaxies that we can then actually get the data for to measure their super massive black hole masses. And then we'll have more data points to put on this diagram and get a much better understanding of what's going on. 
All right, so that was supposed to be a quick recap of the AAS conference. I don't think I achieved that, but let's move on anyway to NASA's OSIRIS-REx mission. The mission which traveled to the asteroid Bennu, high-fived it, threw up all out of dust and rocks, and then collected everything in a canister, sealed it up, flew it back to Earth, and re-entered the atmosphere in September 2023. Since then, the canister has been in a clean room inside a sterile nitrogen glove box, sort of like a, like a fume cupboard in chemistry labs. You know, remember, you should remember those having those in the corner where you used to put your hands in and do all the experiments and everything would get like sucked up. Like it was just so much fun the day that you got to use those in like whatever lesson you were having. It's kind of like that, just to try and keep this, this sample from the asteroid absolutely pristine and not have it contaminated by anything from the Earth's atmosphere. I've made a video before all about the tests that NASA are planning to do on the asteroid sample that they've brought back. If you'd like to check that out, I'll link it in the video description down below. Now the team at NASA managed to collect 60 grams of material from just around the lid of the canister because so much material even lay outside of it. Now that was very close to the target of 70 grams that they'd set for the amount of material that they wanted to collect from Bennu and that was just from around the outside. The majority of it still lay inside the canister. Problem was the lid for that canister was bolted down by 35 bolts that needed to be loosened. Now 33 of those 35 fasteners and bolts they managed to get loose no problem with the tools that had been approved for use inside the glove box on that mission. Because the thing is you can't just grab any old spanner from your home toolbox to do this, right? The tools have to have been approved, they have to make sure that they fit inside the glove box, that by using those tools that they uh, adhere to the clean room standards and they're not going to jeopardize the scientific integrity of the sample by contaminating it somehow. So for a while, the team were just kind of like, well, we can sort of use our tools to like pry up the lid a little bit, make a gap and just like scoop some of the sample out. But in the meantime, they also developed a new tool that would allow them to loosen the fastener. So for all of you that sent me this story this past few months, you will be pleased to know that as of the 10th of January, those last two bolts have now been removed. The lid of the canister is off and now the rest of the disassembly of the canister and the collection of all that material can now commence. Now, if you want to keep an eye on Osiris Rex, the NASA blog for this mission is great. It's kept updated by the team and it even recently had a guest post from none other than Brian May, you know, the guitarist from Queen, who, fun fact, has an astrophysics PhD on solar system dust. And finally, we once again have to chat about the crisis in cosmology, aka the Hubble tension, because there have been three new papers published this month using JWST to investigate the most likely culprit for what we think is causing the Hubble tension or the crisis in cosmology, and the results have come back with a resounding, nope, that's not it. So I've talked a lot about the Hubble tension on this channel before, and I'll link a playlist of videos I've made if you want to do a deep dive into that. But to recap, this is all about our measurement of the current rate of expansion of the universe, what's known as the Hubble constant or H naught. The naught here stands for a redshift of naught or zero, i.e. the universe around us today, the rate of expansion now. Now we do know that the rate of expansion changes with time. We can investigate that with our telescopes that we have, and it's something that the recently launched Euclid Space Telescope will focus on, but that's a separate thing. This crisis or Hubble tension is because we have two different methods for measuring the current rate of expansion of the universe, and they now don't agree with each other at all. All. One way we can do this is to measure both the distance to nearby galaxies and the velocity that they appear to be moving away from us because of the expansion. We then plot one against the other and the slope of this line is the current expansion rate h naught, the Hubble constant. The other method is to model the entire universe, starting with the oldest light we've ever detected from when the universe was just 380,000 years old, what's known as the cosmic microwave background, and then using that as a starting point, then model how the universe has evolved to then give us what we observe around us 
today. And you find the model that gives you the best fit and you look at all the different properties of the universe that pops out. And one of those is the current rate of expansion, H naught, the Hubble constant. Now, at first, those two different methods gave us similar sort of values, just with massive uncertainties on them. And over time, as our telescopes and our analysis methods have got better, those uncertainties have shrunk. And now the two methods values do not agree with each other at all. So for this to be the case, either one, there's something wrong with our observations of nearby galaxies, or two, there's something wrong with our best model of the universe. Now, the second option there is the most exciting one. If that turns out to be the case, then I'm going to learn a lot more new physics by going back to the drawing board. But before we do that, we really do have to exhaust all the other possibilities for option one. And the most likely culprit that we think could be responsible for this tension is that we're measuring the distances to galaxies wrong, something known as the cosmic distance ladder. So we have methods of getting the distances to stars in our own galaxy, the Milky Way, that's sort of the first rung of the ladder. And then the next step up the ladder is to get the distances to galaxies outside of the Milky Way. And to do this, we use something called standard candles, stars that we know are always at the same brightness or an absolute brightness that we know what it is. So we've observed them in our own Milky Way galaxy, we've measured the distances to them there, and then from how bright they appear in other galaxies, we can then work out how far away those other galaxies are. There's a few different type of stars that are used, but the most common and the most well-known are Cepheid variables. Stars that pulse in brightness in proportion to what their maximum brightness is. So if you can measure the time between pulses, you know their absolute maximum brightness they should be. And so from how bright they appear, when they reach their maximum brightness, you can work out what is the distance to the galaxy that that Cepheid variable is in. To do that, though, you have to isolate just the Cepheid variable star's light from the other stars nearby, which even in very close nearby galaxies is a very difficult task for even the Hubble Space Telescope, where all the stars blur into one and you can't separate the stars out. It's what's known as the crowding problem. It means you attribute more light to the Cepheid variable star than it's actually giving out, and you overestimate its brightness and therefore calculate that the galaxy is at a closer distance to us than it actually is. You will then have a bias in your measurement that also gets worse with distance as this crowding problem gets worse as well. And the key thing about these Cepheids here is that they're just one more step on this cosmic distance ladder. They then calibrate the distance to even more distant galaxies that then have another type of standard candle in them called Type 1a supernovae. When a dead star known as a white dwarf reaches its maximum mass and always explodes with the same brightness because that maximum mass is always the same. Because they're so bright, they can be seen to even greater distances, much more than you could ever see the Cepheids out to again because of this crowding problem. And so you've got these sort of calibration steps all the way up that are like dominoes. If any one of them has an issue, it then just falls through to all of the rest of the measurements that you make. And so this is where the James Webb Space Telescope comes in. Its large size gives us the resolution to separate the stars out and work out what light is actually from the Cepheid variable star alone so we can more accurately and precisely work out the distances to these nearby galaxies, which then calibrate the distance to galaxies with the Type 1a supernova that we can observe at greater distances, which is the data that we use to get at this measurement of the Hubble constant that doesn't agree with the one from our best model of the universe. So this is what recent collaborators have done with JWST in this paper released this month for 1,000 Cepheid variable stars in six different galaxies, which all also host type 1a supernova. And they compared the brightness of the Cepheids measured with the Hubble Space Telescope and with the James Webb Space Telescope and found barely any difference. On average, only about 0.1 magnitude, which means that even though they've sorted out the crowding problem by using the resolution of JWST, you're still not overestimating the brightness of the Cepheids. And they show that that difference in brightness is not correlated with distance either, 
as you'd expect if the crowding was the issue here. The solid line in this graph is what they found with their data and the dashed line shows the correlation they would have had to find to solve the Hubble tension and bring those two values into agreement. It rules out the crowding problem as the culprit behind the Hubble tension to an eight sigma certainty. Or to translate that from the statistics, it means that recent collaborators are claiming that there's only a one in a million billion chance that it's this overcrowding problem that's actually responsible for the Hubble tension, this crisis in cosmology, which is a very bold claim and leaves us sort of thinking, well, now what? And okay, I'm, I know it might know what you're thinking here, actually, is that, okay, well, if it's not overcrowding, then what if it's a problem with the Cepheid variables? What if their pulse period is not related to their brightness like we think it is? Well, it's not just Cepheid variables that you can do this with. You can also do this with other standard candles that are observed in the Milky Way that can be observed in nearby galaxies as well, which is exactly what the other two papers released by the same research group did this month. Anand and collaborators used the tip of the red giant branch stars to do this, and Lee and collaborators used the J branch asymptotic giant branch stars. Those methods aren't as well established as you using Cepheid variables, they're fairly new-ish. But what it means you can do is you can sort of double check against the Cepheids. You can then say, okay, what are the distances we find using this method? And both papers found a pretty good agreement. Like there was some minor differences, but again, not enough to explain the Hubble tension. So where does that leave us? Well, it means that the Hubble tension or crisis in cosmology is not caused by that second rung on the cosmic distance ladder. Now, that's not to say that we can rule out option one entirely and say that there's nothing wrong with our observations, our measurements of the distances to nearby galaxies. You know, it could be that there's something else going on here. Perhaps, you know, there's something wrong with that first rung of the cosmic distance ladder. So like with parallax measurements in the Milky Way or with issues with measurements of redshift to get at the velocities those galaxies appear to be moving away from us at. Or one idea is that there's like a systematic problem with the observations that we're taking as well. Although usually if there was a systematic problem, it would affect like a single observatory. And the fact that the measurements from the Hubble Space Telescope pretty much agree quite well with the ones from the James Webb Space Telescope suggests that that's probably not it. All this could be explained if the Milky Way is in a weird void in the universe. Although we heard recently that the opposite was the case and accounting for it also didn't solve the Hubble tension, this crisis in cosmology. And of course, there's a lot more investigations ongoing using data from JWST as well, you know, looking into this idea of the observations being the problem. And they're from other research teams as well. So it's not just like there's one research team working on this. You've got work headed up by Friedman and collaborators, for example, who I know are working on this now, doing some very careful analysis. So we've definitely not heard the end of this yet. I think it's probably just still a little bit too early to get completely excited about alternative, you know, models of the universe just yet in that option two. Although there are some people that have been looking at this, either, you know, thinking about, okay, well, what if the strength of gravity Gravity wasn't constant, for example, or looking at alternative theories of gravity instead of Einstein's theory of general relativity. Again, I've talked a lot about that on this channel before, and I'll link the playlist of videos down below. Or people are looking at, you know, changing the properties of dark energy, the thing that's now causing the accelerated expansion of the universe, which again is something that the Euclid Space Telescope will be looking at in more detail once it starts its scientific survey work. So we'll just have to be a little bit patient for that. One thing is for sure, though, with these results from JDB, T from Reese, Anand, and Leon collaborators ruling out what everybody thought was the most likely culprit to explain this. I think we're going to get a lot more renewed interest in the Hubble tension. Like this will have turned a lot of heads, and we'll have a lot of my astrophysics colleagues turning their attention to this problem in the next year. All right, that's it for Night Sky News for this month. As always, if you snap any pictures of the night sky or you see any space news stories that you want me to explain in a future Night Sky News video, then send them my way over on social media. But until next time, everybody, happy stargazing. But to recrap, but to recrap, to recrap. Oh, someone pipped their horn outside, right? As I said, that was just very rude. Uncertainties have shrinked, shrinked, shrunk. <laughs> That, that, the God, hair stop getting caught in this earring. I love these earrings, but this one shifts. This one just stays put. It's very happy to stay put. This one shifts and gets hair stuck in it. And I'm like, stop it.
I'm not ill. I just, Sam's family have this thing where like, if they, they feel like they could be coming down with something, but they're not actually ill yet, but their body could just be fighting it off and they don't know if they're gonna get ill or not. They say that like, they just feel crilly. <laughs> I don't know where this, if anybody else says like, oh, I feel creely, let me know down in the comments because that is how I feel today. <laughs> so very interesting findings, albeit, 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 albeit. I have to do this one before. Space on with Gordon. And they can start the dis the dis 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 assembly. <sighs> but the results were a big fat nope. <laughs> I don't know why I'm namasteing right now. <laughs> Finally, we once again have to talk about the crisis in cosmology. Again, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> are you all getting tired of talking about the crisis in cosmology now? Because I feel like there's just endless papers on it. Like, you will never get away from the crisis in cosmology. I mean, I'm no Stevie Nicks, but I tried. 